Hello, and welcome to Tools and Craft. I'm your host, Devin Zugel, and today I'm talking with Michael Nielsen. Michael is a scientist who explores ideas and tools that help people think and create, both individually and collectively. Michael helped pioneer quantum computing and the modern open science movement, and he also has the honor of being the person who originally introduced me to the ideas of Tools for Thought almost a decade ago. So really, we can thank him for the existence of this entire podcast. Michael defies field boundaries more than anyone I can think of. He's leapt around from physics to meta science to educational tools to programming and beyond, and he's made tremendous contributions to each field he bumps into along the way. So Michael, thank you so much for taking the time for this conversation. Thanks for having me on, Devin. One thing that you've said before is that you believe that far better social processes are possible in science and that these could activate great latent potential for discovery. How have the, these social processes of science changed since you first started doing science? There's a lot more emphasis on accountability. I think I mean, that, that sounds like a good thing. In fact, in many ways, it is a good thing. Um, so in particular, a lot of science funders around the world do more exercises where they try to assess just how well things are going. Um, I, probably the best known example of this uh, is in the UK where they run what's called, used to be called the research assessment exercise, and they assess um, all the universities and university departments to try and determine the quality of their research, whatever quality of research means, and that determines things about the way in which they get funded. When I was in Australia as an academic, there was a similar exercise taking place. Um, it's maybe a little bit mixed. Uh, people end up gaming the system a little bit or trying to game the system. They worry so much about you know the impact this has on funding that they can actually end up essentially you know, Goodhart's law where uh, what gets measured uh, gradually becomes a target. Well, people start to target these kinds of exercises and it actually uh, can sometimes distort uh, what it is they do and that's not always a good thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's a really, one really big change. And how do they measure quality? Well, it varies from place to place. The, the two most common approaches, one is bibliometric, so they will count the number of papers, they will count the number of citations, those are not terrible things to be looking at, but when they become targets, they become uh, really quite strange uh, things to be to be looking at. There's a uh, uh, interesting uh, paper I was just looking at earlier today, uh, which suggests that the use of those kinds of measures um, in Italy since 2011 um, has actually perhaps led to the creation of uh, citation rings and lots of self-citation and things like that. It's not certain that that's what's going on, but at least suggestive uh, that this is not very good for the process of science. Um, so that's one sort of approach, this sort of very data-driven approach where you're not really looking at what's actually being done at all. Um, you're just using these kind of very gross sort of metadata. And the other approach uh, tends to be more panels where you have individual, usually uh, uh, pretty well-known, pretty senior scientists, will try and assess a whole bunch of uh, research outputs from different people. They might ask for things like every person in the department has to submit their three best or five best or however many best papers from the last three years or five years or however many years, um, and they'll try and assess you know, how important that work was and develop some kind of a aggregate sense of a department or a university in that way. So that approach is also uh, pretty pretty common with lots of variations between different funders. Uh, it's probably, it's certainly a little bit harder to game, but there are still ways it, it, it can be gamed. Well, let's assume that a scientist does not want to commit fraud, but they do want to craft their research agenda to get as high of a score on this as possible, um, maybe maximize the number of citations they can get. What are the characteristics of research agendas that will, or lines of inquiry that will uh, tend to get more citations and t tend to map to this, this score more highly? So, I mean, there's at least two things. Um, one is just you know, joining very large collaborations is often a way of increasing this for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, you know, you may end up as an author on a very large number of different papers well, you're just sort of part of the collaboration that is producing it. Maybe you're working on a detector in a particle physics experiment. 
um, and that detector is used in a lot of different experiments. And as a result, you end up as an author on a lot of different papers. And what's more, there will be quite legitimately a lot of self-citation amongst those, those papers. They're all kind of interrelated. And the other thing that it will certainly tend to do is drive people to work on things which are extremely fashionable, uh, which have a lot of people already working on them. And there's some potential for you to have a you know, high impact in this, in this kind of way. It's significantly more difficult to carve out a career doing something where you're the only person or there's only one or two other people in the world who are currently interested in that, in that topic. You're just not going to look so good on a bunch of these measures. And when people are very aware of that kind of thing, um, it tends to suppress such work. Hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. And, and a co collaboration that produces many papers, maybe, maybe each of those papers is very good and a very high quality, but they're sort of closer in the ideas space to each other than papers on completely different topics. And so it's, it seems a little odd for that to be counted as the same number of citations, even if it's sort of the same cluster of concepts. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, it's sort of a funny thing. It's using the citations for a purpose. They're not designed for at all. The person who started the um, uh, Science Citation Index and sort of all the interest in citation counting, uh, Eugene Garfield, um, he wasn't thinking of it as a way of doing this kind of impact assessment at all. He was interested in, in well, that's, that's a little too strong. Uh, he was very slightly interested in it, but that wasn't his, his main interest. He was interested in tracking the lineage of ideas. And in particular, he was really interested in like figuring out where there were errors in the scientific record, enabling people to, to, to track down uh, errors and, and things like that. So quite a different sort of a purpose. Uh, and of course, citations themselves, you know, they're not meant to be intrinsically a measure of, of importance. They're something else. I mean, it's just saying we, we were influenced in this way by that paper. It also might have been a more effective measure initially be before people caught on that it was going to be used that way. The, the idea of taking a snapshot of a sy system is very different from using uh, a metric for a system that has, is going to be an input to the system itself later on, because now you, you, you change the system by observing it. If you had to design a, a quantitative metric for the quality of science, how would you do it? Or would you reject the concept entirely? I think what I'd probably do if you, know, you put a gun to my head and said I had to do it, you know, is recruit a lot of different teams made up of very different types of people, but there'd be a lot of historians of science and sociologists of science and philosophers of science and, uh, I don't, you know, uh, people who are interested in sort of the, the qualitative evolution of ideas and who are interested in the details to try and understand things in that very qualitative way first. You need to understand it in a way that you know, is not immediately quantitative or scalable before you can develop good quantitative measures. Scientists are not... Um, you know, making their judgments individually just by citation counting or, or doing something like that. You try and understand the evolution of ideas in your own area and figure out what is actually intrinsically important. What should you be working on? What kinds of ideas are actually important for the future of the field? And people, you know, there's a fair amount of heterogeneity. Different people have different opinions uh, on that. It's not necessarily clear that you can actually entirely eliminate that heterogeneity. It might be in fact, I, I believe it is probably true that those differences of, of, of opinion are actually very generative and are very necessary. And if you take that point of view seriously, then what it means is that in some sense, you no know, metric is ever going to capture all of that. So the, the attempt to say what is most important is actually answering the wrong question. What you should be trying to do instead is generate a, a portfolio of different directions, some of which may be in some sense, mutually inconsistent. Actually, let me give an example. Um, uh, quantum gravity is a, a really sort of famous example in, in physics. There's this long-standing problem resolving sort of an apparent conflict, uh, conflict or inconsistency uh, between the theories of quantum mechanics and the theory of general relativity, our best, our best theory of gravity. And there, is, there are a number of different schools of thought about how best uh, to do this. And if you insist on just picking out something as the best, once you've done that, you will then concentrate all your attention 
on on one particular uh, approach. But if instead you say, you know, let's just allow for at least some period of time different approaches to flourish and not try and determine uh, which of the two or three or five or ten different approaches is best, um, I think you know, usually that's a, a significantly better way. Something I, I like about, about Silicon Valley, actually, you know, if you have two competitors in a space, let's say you talk about, say, I don't know, Netflix and Blockbuster, sort of two classic competitors, the fact is, like, for a long time, although they're competing for the, the same market in some respects, they they have their own internal infrastructure and capital and 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 momentum, and you don't have a situation where employees at Blockbuster are conducting the performance evaluations for people at Netflix and determining who gets promoted and these kinds of things. And yet the situation in science often resembles that a little bit, where somebody in one school of thought is actually the person, you know, doing the the, the, the peer review for somebody in a completely different school of thought. And I think it's actually good to be able to have those silos exist independently for some period, extended period of time. Ultimately, you do want to be able to sort of make a, a resolution of which is the, the, the better approach. Um, but in the meantime, giving one veto power over the other just seems uh, kind of hopeless to me. Certainly, you know, I'm, I'm quite certain that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the CEO of Blockbuster would have given very negative performance reviews to the people at Netflix for a long time. As soon as you made that analogy, I was like, oh, my goodness, that is that is exactly what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the imagery that it's pops so in my mind, the imagery that pops in mind of these silos is of the Galapagos Islands. They have these islands yeah. where different species were able to evolve independent of each other and you end up with much greater diversity. How do you keep those silos while also allowing some of the cross pollination of ideas that is also so important? Um. I mean, the cross pollination of ideas is is independent to some extent of the you know mutual evaluation of the ideas. And to be clear, some mutual evaluation is great, but uh, you don't want that to be sort of the only factor that determines p- people's continued existence. I mean, some of the ideas that 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 people have talked about and explored are things like actually, I mean, a, a popular one now uh, it will be gradually becoming a topic of investigation is the idea of randomizing grant funding. So basically you, you know, somebody applies uh, with a, a, a project idea and instead of having a peer review where you essentially try and rank all the proposals and only fund the best, quote unquote, unquote the best, um, instead there's kind of a basic sanity check round of peer review so that people with crank proposals are being rejected. And then after that, there's uh, simply a random selection made and uh, whoever's lottery numbers come up, um, get funded. And a benefit of doing this kind of thing is that you're not suppressing ideas in that kind of way. You're not putting the blockbuster employees in charge of the, the, the performance evaluation of, of the Netflix employees. Um, you're just relying on individual scientists to make their best judgment about what they think is the best possible idea subject to that basic sanity check. So um, I guess the, I think the first place that did this in the world was the New Zealand, was it Health Research Council, I think it's called, um, and a few other grant agencies have done small pilot trials uh, since then, but it's certainly not a widely used uh, approach. And I suppose if you, as a funding agency, knew the relative importance of different research ahead of time, you would have already done the science. That is sort of solving the problem in, in, in some sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such a funny thing. One of the reasons why we regard an idea as tremendously important is because it was a priori so unlikely. Um, I don't know, one of my favorite examples, one of my heroes, the biologist Lynn Margulis, um, she's the person who proposed, I mean, the really just the incredible, almost ludicrous idea of endosymbiosis. And she was opposed for a long time uh, in this idea. But my understanding, I mean, this is now accepted by, by, by biologists. I don't know, there's some funny, interesting tension between the importance of an idea and how a priori plausible it is. She's one of these people who just has tremendous force and sort of willingness uh, to persist even when everybody else is, is telling her over and over that she's, uh, that she's wrong. So, something really interesting, of course, about biology is that um, we regard both single-celled systems and multicellular organisms both as forms of life. 
And that's incredibly interesting that we call, we, we unite both of those. Why don't we regard uh, an animal with, you know, a thousand cells? Why don't we regard it as a, as a, a thousand separate uh, uh, living beings? It's interesting that we, that we don't do that. Like what sort of the, the boundary between what we consider an organism and, and not a, you know, and, and a cell is, uh, at least to me, it's, it's not entirely obvious. I wonder now if we're missing things because we're often when we, when we put things in categories, it's so that we can think about them and make generalizations about the things in the category. So now it makes me wonder what are we missing by blobbing them all together and what, what, what might we learn if we were to split them apart? Yeah. I, I, um, uh, one of my favorite little facts is that apparently that uh, in linguistics, like the subject of what is a word is apparently somewhat controversial and there's sort of different schools of thought on what should be considered a word or not. Uh, as a physicist, like you get really used to having often very clean categories and some notion of sort of correct categories. At first, it's really frustrating that there don't seem to be these clean conceptual cleavages. It's really interesting. <laughs> I often feel that way uh, moving into different realms from from programming. Programming is a little messier maybe than physics, but it still in, has a lot of things that are literally binary in the sense of they're, they're a Boolean value. Um, and when things are digital, it, you know, and there's, there's, a, there's a sense of this code produces the results I'm looking for or it does not. Um, whereas moving into other realms more like design or politics, um, often I'll ask someone a question that I think must have a simple answer. And it's always like, well, it depends. And sometimes it might even depend on what the person involved had for lunch that day. <laughs> so there's, there's yeah. no clean answer. I always feel like with, uh, JavaScript is kind of a little bit an, ex an exception in some kind of way. <laughs> like it's so um, surprising. I often can't remember how stuff is done because, yeah, there's all these like weird exceptions and you know things are done in strange ways like if you want to delete a dom element you need to find the parent and then delete the child like this is crazy as a design whereas something like python seems much more like um yeah they, they tried to make a language that was pretty consistent um and usually there's a way of doing stuff um i, I always feel like javascript seems a little bit more it's almost more biological <laughs> it's like it just you know uh there's no real uniformity or consistency it was you know it evolved to be whatever it is that is a great way to put it um and i see that as its greatest strength and its greatest weakness <laughs> yeah i mean it's a beautiful language in some really interesting way uh, um this is, i love um i don't know if you've ever read kevin kelly's book um out of control um, no i haven't yeah, so he wrote this great book in the early 90s which uh I read, and at the time I thought, oh, this is good, but it wasn't like making a really deep impression on me. But the, the thesis is, it's in the title, Out of Control. It was that human beings had gotten really good at designing and building systems, which they understand really well and where they try and get very close, tight control of all the different elements and sort of... Um, Almost Le Corbusier's, I don't know how you say, how you say his name. The, the, you Sounds know, the, right to the, me. The modernist uh, city uh, uh, planner, you know, lots of straight lines and, and, and this kind of stuff. And Kelly's thesis was that we were going to move in our machines to much more biological uh, kind of systems where we would intrinsically not be able to control uh, the systems they would be having, we would essentially trade off power against ability to control. So they would begin to you know, be based on sort of evolutionary processes and other ideas from biology. Um, and we would accept this because we would get so much power from them, but uh, we would give up some of our expectations. And um, um, and you're sort of seeing this, this systems that formerly were under control are, are getting out of control. It reminds me of conversations I've had with a lot of friends who previously ran fairly small companies and then you scale them up or they are deciding whether or not they want to go for being a larger organization. And when it's just you and two or three other employees, it's very easy to see what's going on and have visibility and control, control the situation. 
but there's only so much that four people can get done. Um, whereas if you're running a 10,000 person organization, you have very little control over what's going on, um, but you get a lot more power. And I think the people who are in the latter category often are drive themselves a little bit crazy because they, they realize that they can't totally get what they want done. But at the same time, they can go so much farther than if it's just a small group. Um, so that, 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 Remind me of that it, it also reminds me of a lot of artificial intelligence discourse, um, yeah. where so much around uh, being able to understand what an AI is doing is the, that interpretability is such a key first step to being able to control it, and it's something that I think a lot of people working on AI are concerned about because the the capabilities are far beyond what we understand at the moment. Just just to go back, a mutual friend who's a CEO. Um, the comment was it that um, it is often hard for them, harder for them to know what's going inside uh, inside the company than it is for almost anybody else. Uh, I think when you when you're in a very senior position, although it gives you like this sort of bird's eye view, like whenever you're supervising, basically whenever somebody's supervising somebody else or is in a supervisory position, there are certain things that the the person you know who is the underling um, might be nervous or uncomfortable about sharing with their boss or their boss's boss or their boss's 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 boss, uh, just for sort of natural, you know, reasons. You don't want to I don't know, complain that you don't like the lunch menu or whatever necessarily, or anything that might, you know, you, you worry a lot, I guess, about your relationship to, to that person. And so it creates a really interesting kind of opacity, in fact, um, to the person at the top of the organization. In some sense, the CEO has, less visibility uh, sort of intrinsically into some parts of the organization than, than just a random new hire can go and find out what people really think about certain issues. It's that observability effect again. It's similar to the citations. Like as soon as someone's looking at something, the, the behavior will change um, or at least it will mask itself so that it doesn't get read in a way that is unfavorable or just out of control for that for that particular person. That seems exactly right. You'd said something about biology being one of the fields that you you, you aren't so familiar with. Um, I would go so far as to say it's one of the few fields that you're not familiar with considering how far, how many different <laughs> places that you've done work in science. Uh, as you've gone from different field to, to different field, what are signs that you read that help help you see that you maybe can contribute something to a field you hadn't previously studied? I mean, I, there are two things that go on. One, sometimes I just get curious about, about the field and, you know, there's no particular sort of opportunity to contribute. Um, I might just, you know, pay attention to it for, for some period of time, talk with people about it, read about it, and do those kind of things. So that's not really, I'm not working in the field at that point. What I want is just, one insight that seems worth building on and like it might actually potentially be important. Um, so it's a very local kind of a thing. You know, it, it's not anything more than just having one little creative thing that feels like it should be done. Often actually it, it feels like a little tiny creative thing, a project that should take a week and then it takes three months or six months or two years <laughs> or something like that because it sort of unfolds. But uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I do a lot of things like that. Like I've never seriously worked on AI, but every once in a while, I'll just take a week or something like that because there'll be some little question I have that maybe I can't find the answer to in any paper. And so I'll just play around with that and try and get a little bit of insight into it and maybe write up some notes. Yeah. And you sort of just re repeat that often enough. And sometimes, um, you know, things get start to seem very interesting in, in, in some particular direction and you start to do a lot of work on something and, you know, maybe uh, actually start to develop some, uh, at least a little bit of expertise. It's not, I don't know, I, I, I don't have a sort of a conscious theory of how this happens. Um, when was the last time that you had a little project like that that ended up expanding to to take more of your headspace than you anticipated? Yeah, it's a project with Kenjin Q that's uh, an essay, a, a short essay that we thought might take a couple of months to write about well, actually, we didn't even know what it, we did. What I what I now think it was about. We had no idea that it was going to be about that at, at first. It was just going to be some thoughts on 
on science funding and, and how it you know, might be done better. And it's turned into something completely different. Uh, it's taken 18 months and many thousands of hours to, to do. Um, so it uh, started with some simple ideas and turned out to be about something completely different. It turned out to be about um, really the extent to which the scientific system, the discovery system that we have is able to learn and change and update itself. So that system does a really great job of updating its ideas. Um, uh, lots of people can contribute to that. But if you're talking about its social processes, the sort of the institutions of power by which it operates, those only change relatively slowly. Uh, and that's the question that ultimately we got interested in and started to think about. I remember you talking about some of these questions many, many, many years ago. So it sounds like something that you've been thinking about and chewing on in the back of your head for many years. Um, is that typical of the types of problems that end up grabbing your attention for a long periods of time where you've had something working in the back of your head for, for a while, or does sometimes it comes out of the blue and it's something you've never really thought about before? But both happen. Um, in this particular case, about 15 years ago, I took a few years to work as an open science advocate and to develop a bunch of ideas around open science. And those are all sort of very concrete instantiations of this problem. How do you change and update the social processes of science? And of course, I, di I didn't think of them in that way at, that, at the time. I didn't conceive of them in that kind of abstract form. But then later coming back and realizing, oh, I've seen a lot of these problems in sort of very specific forms, but they're actually instances of a much more general pattern. In this particular case, it was kind of revisiting something from a long time ago. One pattern I really like actually is, um, I don't know, maybe this is just an excuse for self-indulgence, uh, but I do tend to find that if I get, I think most people have like sort of, you know, various guilty pleasures, uh, things that they enjoy doing or reading or whatnot that they feel that they really shouldn't. They should be, you know, doing hard at work on their, you know, actual serious projects. Um, and I've noticed over and over again that, that, you know, many sort of guilty pleasures like that ultimately end up becoming, uh, you know, five years or 10 years later, the creative projects that I work on. I was a quantum physicist. I wasn't supposed to be thinking about, uh, certainly not about open science, um, but I just got really interested in the way like the Linux kernel development was being done and the way Wikipedia was being constructed. And then some strange, I mean, a whole bunch of other strange questions. This sounds very highfalutin said that way. There was also many other sort of less highfalutin things, but that's what turned ultimately into the interest in, in open science. And this pattern just sort of happens over and over again. That's been a pattern in my own work as well, although it's it's quite different types of work. But the, the kinds of things that I find myself working on thinking about today is something that the, the types of things that I was blogging about and thinking about and researching in my off hours three, three to six years ago. Paul Buckeye, he had this really nice uh, heuristic. He commented when he'd started investing, he would sometimes turn some founders down. They would pitch. He would think, oh, that's obviously not going to work. Um, he would turn them down. And then he'd find that he just couldn't stop. Like he would keep thinking about their proposal over and over in sort of the, the days after. And then eventually he, he'd realized that whenever that was the case, he should go back and invest. His sort of unconscious mind, I guess, was, was uh, apparently uh, uh, trying to tell him something about, about the proposal. It was telling him, uh, I, I guess, more or less, that there was something interesting about the proposal, something that he didn't recognize, something that was new. Um, and potentially interesting. But I think that's, you know, that's a very general pattern. We get interested in things uh, for reasons that often we can't articulate. In fact, it's the fact that we can't articulate them that is the reason that we get interested. It's the sense of, you know, there's some new pattern here, there's some interesting new structure in the world that we haven't seen before um, that is actually grabbing our attention. Um, but of course, once you start to master that, it becomes a tool that you can use uh, in other pursuits. Anyway, that's my way of mm. you know justifying uh, uh, many wasted hours on YouTube and uh, other places. <laughs> I think it's I think it's very compelling. Um, I, I, I I think I'm going to be thinking about this over the next few days. In fact, I'm going to come back to it. <laughs> Yeah, urbanism. So, yeah, one of your uh, great interests is 
I mean, very much that for me, like, you know, we both uh, know and love the work of, of Jane Jacobs and many people like that. You know, I had no work related reason for, for reading Jane Jacobs, that's for sure. And yet she's one of the, the people who's influenced me the most ever, just the way she thinks about really building uh, complex systems and what it means to do well and how we should do it. Um, and that influences absolutely everything else I do. Um, but I wasn't thinking that when I, when I read her, her work, uh, it was just, this is really interesting for some reason I don't entirely understand. Now that you say that, I, I see a lot of resonance between the way you think about science as an ecosystem and the way she, she talks about cities as ecosystems and how they yeah. can remain healthy and strong um, and vibrant. Yeah. I mean, she has this amazing sort of Hayekian point of view where there's lots of decentralized knowledge, which is held. I mean, this is all you know, me constructing meaning sort of after the, after the fact, but yeah, you know, it's another example of the use of decentralized knowledge to improve society. Um, and that then influences certainly very much so the way I think about about science funding. You have uh, sort of the eyes on the street in Jane Jacobs, which is providing safety and security and so many other things. Um, in uh, science, you can either have very centralized funders making all the decisions, or you can try and devolve a lot of trust out to individual scientists and trust that individual scientists um, very often actually have a much better idea of how to spend their talents um, than uh, some centralized kind of vetoing power. There's a, a structural similarity between those arguments. There's many, many ways that that kind of thing has, has influenced my thinking about science funding and about many other things. The beauty of a truly powerful analogy too is that it can predict things that you hadn't considered yet. So they're, they're if you, you know, instead of being that one-to-one -one mapping, it's a many-to-many -many, many mapping. And once you observe something about one system, you realize, oh, maybe this is true about the other one as well. Um, and so I have you have you had that experience with the comparison of cities to science? Well, actually, I'm just having it right now. In fact, I've never really made this particular uh, uh, sort of type of analogy before. I'm just wondering, you know, what the analogy of safety uh, and eyes on the street is in, in science. Yeah, maybe there's some analogy to be made to the process by which we keep science scientific results uh, reliable. Okay, so to just go in a completely different direction, where the, Jane Jacobs makes this lovely point that um, you want city block sizes to be very small. The smaller they are, the more rapidly you can get mixing because you have sort of cross streets, so people from other uh, streets can 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 come in. You have basically instead of having a one dimensional system, you actually start to get access to to a full two dimensional. Uh, grid, and I'm wondering what the analog of uh, small small block sizes in in science is. Actually, maybe it's got something to do with kind of the size of the organizational units you use to do science. Maybe if they're relatively small and they're put in serious contact with each other on a relatively frequent basis, maybe you know every three months, there's kind of an interdisciplinary confab where two or three of these units uh, get together and, and uh, sort of talk to each other or something like that. On the sa safety one, it makes me think about policing and how um, communities that have the, the highest rates of safety or the lowest rates of crime, it's t typically not because they have tons of police on the streets. It's t it tends to be because there's social norms and cultural norms that keep people from harming each other. Um, also lots of other factors like wealth and opportunities and w whether people have options besides robbing each other and so on. I have never been a scientist, but I could imagine that it's much more motivating for people to do great science and have honest results if it's because they, they want to impress their fellow scientists and they want to legitimately find an interesting contribution. Whereas if it, if there's some sort of, you know, national body that makes sure that your science is good, that's probably a lot less personally motivating. That's certainly true. But I think there's a, an even more fundamental thing, which is there's just the enjoyment of doing good work and, and of, and of understanding. I certainly had the experience and I think a lot of other, other people do too, of, starting to really understand mathematics as a teenager and 
really giving up video games as a result because mathematics was so much more interesting. And then a little bit later, science was so much more interesting. Like, why, you know, would I be trying to to play video games when I could be doing something that was a thousand times more rewarding, just intrinsically? Didn't I didn't need anybody else to see it. Um, it was just intrinsically rewarding. Mathematics is, I think, really, it has this incredible clarity in that way. If, uh, I remember understanding Euclid's proof that there are an infinitely many primes and the idea that the square root of two is irrational and a bunch of sort of very elementary results like this. And it's just uh, I mean, the most incredibly beautiful thing. And then you start to get given you know, little problems of your own and, and, and you start to have the same kind of shock of understanding. That's just so rewarding. <laughs> um, uh, so I think there's a lot of that as well, which is independent of impressing your peers, which is not to say that that's not also important, but, but I think for many people that just discovery is already such a motivating factor in doing it right. So I find I meet a surprising number of people who, you know, they've heard about the replication crisis in psychology or things like this. And they think that scientists need to be policed or that somehow the incentives aren't right. And sometimes they they don't understand what an enormous intrinsic incentive there is. Um, And to the extent that you can just center that, you're in very good. On the point of intrinsic motivation, how widespread do you think that is in the population of scientists? Like if you were to pluck a random scientist out of a hat, do you think that that would apply to the, to the, that person more likely than not? Certainly the scientists I've met in my life, I think the great majority of them, if they wanted to become wealthy or powerful or high status, they had many other things that they could have done that, that, you know, would have afforded them greater opportunity to do that. I think most of them just absolutely adored science. Um, that's not always true. Actually, it tends to be they either absolutely adored science as kids or else there was sort of a little bit of luck or chance and then, you know, they were in the right lab at the right time or something like that and all of a sudden they realised, oh, this is great. And so they they forwent those other uh, possibilities. I mean, with that said, like, it, it is difficult to escape some type of careerism. People like to eat. Um, um, Most people, all other things being equal, do prefer to have a higher salary. There are these very sad cases of people uh, committing fraud, or in some cases, maybe it's not fraud, but they're doing something very dubious. Uh, Very often, it seems what's going on in those cases is you know, people who just become too invested in some false notion of success and they're disconnected from what um, they're really supposed to be doing. So no, it's sort of sad individually and, of course, pretty terrible for, for our society. And I could even imagine a situation where that's not inconsistent with some intrinsic motivation. I I can reflect on times where, let's say I'm having a conversation with somebody about a topic I'm deeply interested in, and I actually want to learn from them really, really badly. But then some, sometimes I'll have a moment where I think, if I ask this question, I will look stupid. It will lower my status in their eyes because they will think, she doesn't know that already. And I always try very hard to push through that feeling because I like I do, yeah. I do value the information, but I can feel the tug of, of Maybe I maybe I just should hold back. Maybe I shouldn't ask this question. Um, okay. And I, I don't think that that is inconsistent with me wanting to know the answer. It's just another feeling that is layered on top. Yeah. So it's it's not too hard to imagine a situation where, yeah, I I really do care about the truth about finding something, le- learning about something uh, in science. But also, I want to make sure that my lab gets funding otherwise we won't be able to continue and those two things i think um while they end up having conflicting results they they can exist they can certainly coexist in something you wrote you you said you you quoted somebody i should have written down who it was and that person said that in the 1920s when quantum mechanics was discovered it was a period in which it was very easy for any second-rate physicist to do first-rate work 
And uh, you, you then said, history suggests that the early days of new scientific fields are often golden ages with fundamental questions about the world being answered quickly and easily. And th this feels to me like one of those, you know it when you see it things, um, but I'm really curious, like what to you does it mean to create a new field? Oh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And one I don't understand the answer to very well. Um, like the question, what is a field is a really interesting one and really complicated. One possible set of associations you might have is to some deep set of related ideas. So for example, uh, the Maxwell Lorentz equations are used to describe the electromagnetic uh, phenomenon. This is an incredibly deep set of uh, ideas. You can spend all of your days just studying the consequences of uh, these equations, understanding all kinds of electrical and magnetic uh, phenomena. So in that kind of approach to think about what a field is, you know, a field is somehow a social structure that grows up around a particular deep set of ideas. Now, so something like physics, you know, it's not a single deep set of ideas. It's actually a whole lot of sort of loosely related ones. There's quantum mechanics, there's condensed matter physics, there's astrophysics, there's hydrodynamics. In fact, all of these, you know, it's, it's a loose agglomeration. Um, so, you know, I've started with deep ideas, but then you also have these kind of political uh, structures that sit on top of them. You know, is it a field? Is it something uh, which has a named department at universities or not? You know, you've made it entirely a political thing then. But actually, the time at which you start to get program officers and program managers at major uh, funders is often a very important time of transition uh, in a field. It, it will you know, before that happens, there's not really any opportunity for a set of ideas to start uh, to grow. I was uh, involved a fair amount, as you know, in the early days, um, relatively early days of, of quantum computing. And it was really interesting to watch as people started to get the ability to do things like run conferences or submit to journals. It sounds crazy, but actually it was it was actually quite difficult to know where to publish at certain times because there wasn't really a, a sort of a, a publication home. So all these different kinds of entities, there's sort of different transitions that that, that take place in, in 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 the life of a field. But I do think, I don't know, at the core, if there's not a deep set of ideas, there can't possibly be a field. And the reason, I know, the reason I've expounded at such uh, enormous length here, um, uh, there's sort of two interesting things that, that can happen. Um, I, I like to think of Potemkin fields, um, which <laughs> I, I won't try and name any particular examples, but it's when you know, sort of money and interest tries to declare that something is a field, but there's no deep set of ideas. And... You know, you can spend as much money as you like. If no deep set of ideas is discovered, you'll have plenty of activity. You might have journals, you might have all kinds of things happening, but there will never really be any any substance to it. Um, and and this, this affects to some extent or can affect interdisciplinary work where, you know, maybe you have two fields, both of which are grounded in deep sets of ideas, but just declaring something to be at the intersection doesn't mean that there's there's sort of in, you know, interesting deep ideas to be discovered there. Sometimes there is. Uh, actually, I think quantum computing basically occurred by people mashing up quantum mechanics with computer science, but sometimes um, interdisciplinary work can sort of flounder a bit because there'll be people trying to work at the intersection of two fields. For these Potemkin fields, um, I like that phrase a lot. You might be able to make the case that computing in the 19th century was an example of a Potemkin field. So people like Charles Babbage, you know, attempting to invent the field of computer science, they actually got a fair amount of support for it, but they probably didn't quite actually just, it just wasn't, the time wasn't quite right for it. So they were, you know, they were, they had some nice sort of starter ideas. They were asking great fundamental questions. They were able to make a little bit of progress but the time wasn't right for the field to exist. And so they weren't really, they, they weren't able to get to sort of the, the incredible set of ideas that, that Turing and von Neumann and others had in the 1930s and 1940s. And then, you know, made so many more, the invention of the transistor and, and so on and so forth. What would you consider the, the fieldiest field, like the archetyp archetypal field <laughs> of a field? Physics was very successful early, particularly classical mechanics, Newton's Newtonian mechanics and, and, so it's very tempting to say, oh, 
this is the the the, the prototype for a field. Um, but part of what's exciting is when things work in very different ways, where they don't, where they violate those expectations. I don't know much about AI, but when I hear some of the criticisms that are made by skeptics, I maybe hear a little bit that they're trying to force it into an old mold. So they want systems that they can really understand, like, you know, how they operate. Um, if they're talking about things like language models, you know, they want to be able to understand the relationship of the model to things like the different parts of speech, nouns, verbs, grammar, and so on. And we just don't have that. And we don't have a principled under- way of understanding the way in which really any of the large models, the, the big foundation models, um, are, are operating on here. Maybe some of the old standards actually shouldn't be applied. There's usually some kind of back and forth interplay between tinkering and and, and uh, just sort of fooling around with stuff. And you know, that sometimes then can be improved by a detailed scientific understanding of what's going on. And you know, maybe the difference in the case of AI, maybe you don't actually need the deep understanding step quite as much because, in fact, we can do the experiments so quickly. But this is kind of a, you know, the, the, I think the skeptic says um, you're never going to have successful artificial intelligence if you don't stop and understand what these systems are doing. You know, look at the history of the way we've improved technologies in the past. We always needed to understand how they operate. And then the counterpoint to that is, well, yeah, that's, that's true, um, but actually we're in a different situation today. Um, our ability to test our tinkering is just so much greater than it has been uh, in, in the past. We can try many, many, many more possibilities just automatically, so we don't need really strong theoretical explanations to rule out incorrect lines of investigation. We can instead just try a trillion or a trillion, trillion, trillion different things uh, and rely on our ability to recognise when something is working rather than to derive from first principles the reason why it's working. It sounds like you're describing sort of feeling towards understanding as opposed to like thinking towards understanding. It was Is that yeah. a way you would put it? A, a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, very much this sort of intuitive approach where you don't necessarily systematically understand why things are improving, but... Uh, but 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 yeah, you just keep trying uh, things without that sort of details. F- feeling is not a not a bad way of putting it. I don't yeah, think you, I, can, I, you can't you, you can't go from like um, you know the Roman steam engine to you know a modern Tesla like by without having sort of a lot of scientific explanation um, somewhere in between, uh, even though there is some some lineage there. And in some sense, we're trying to do that on the AI side um, without that sort of the detailed understanding in between time. And so you can, it's easy to see why you might be skeptical, but you just, you couldn't test trillion, uh, you know, trillion, trillions of, of, uh, of intermediate technologies in the past. I think what I'm imagining is if different things we could build or technologies we could operate are a tree and you have all these different choices that you could make similar to the choices you could make in chess. The the human mind has to build models that make it more clear which paths to go down yeah. because we just cannot compute all of the different possible paths. But with a, with an, a, an AI, with a computer, we can just run them down all the paths and see is, if, is there anything at the end that's interesting. And it can come back and sort of tell us. And then we don't need to have as much of a model of understanding why that path is the one, right one because we've, we've tried them all and we just, pick the one that has the result that we want. Yeah, that, 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 that's, uh, you've just said much more clearly what I was trying to say than I said. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I had never considered that before. And, and I don't follow AI nearly as closely as you do. Is this something that you're seeing in the behavior of how AI researchers are doing their work? It's how when I talk to sort of AI researchers versus uh, some of the critics of the AI researchers, I, I sort of, I see that dichotomy a lot. Um, I, it's possible I'm, I'm unfairly characterizing some or all of these people, but when I see uh, people like like David or to some extent Gary Marcus, certainly Noam Chomsky, um, critiquing approaches to AI, that seems to me like a big part of what they're saying. 
you know, is that we should have detailed understanding telling us, you know, which, which in your, in your way of describing it, which of those branches not to go down, you know, which ones are the correct ones to go down. And they're not very happy with a situation where people essentially say, let's just go down all of them and rely on the ability to, to recognize at the end. Whereas the thrust of the AI researchers seems to be they're much happier just just trying a very large number of different things. So um, a really interesting question and answer with um, the AI researcher Ian Goodfellow. And uh, somebody asked the question, it's along the lines of, you know, do you feel upset when one of your experiments doesn't work out? And he says, oh, no, not at all. I, I adopt what I, I consider a high throughput approach to experimentation. In fact, while, run, while doing this question and answer session, I, I've set a whole bunch of different experiments running and seen the, 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 the results. Um, so for him, it's just this sort of very cheap thing where he's able to keep asking questions and keep getting answers very, very, very quickly. Enough so that he can he can do it while actually participating in a Q and A. Apparently, I really like that that terminology. Uh, uh, sort of a high throughput approach to to experimentation. It seems to me like a in many ways a fundamental shift in in how we think about science. Something that friends who work in uh, AI labs, commercial uh, industrial AI labs, now do tell me that one thing that they have noticed that is a difference is there is much more emphasis put on having access to really first-rate engineering resources. So in the past, some poor grad student had to, you know, write all the code and, and, and you know, arrange all the infrastructure. Now there will be a team that just specialises in, uh, uh, you know, making sure all the infrastructure is working extremely well, being able to rapidly scale up experiments and do these kinds of things. How do you think physics experiments would be different or physics in general would be different if physicists had more of this mindset of let's just throw as many experiments on the wall as possible and see what sticks um i mean there's often intrinsic time scales in in physical systems that makes it makes it hard my one published experiment i'm a theoretical physicist my one published experiment we were using a particular molecule to do an nmr experiment and we needed to wait roughly three minutes at the time, end of every uh, cycle, simply for the, the molecule to relax back to its original ground state. Um, when we we're sort of just setting up, we would typically wait, I think we'd wait like 50, 60, 70 seconds. So it wasn't really being reset properly, but it was mostly being reset. And that was just for us to kind of, you know, do some an initial rough calibration. Um, but later on, when we were actually doing the, uh, the real experiments, there was just this really annoying three minute wait. And everything would have been so much easier if we could have eliminated that. But we didn't have access to the physical, like we, you know, we would have loved to be able to actually go in and do it. It would have sped things up so much. And then if we'd had multiple machines in parallel, that also um, would have been very profound for us. But I, I can't remember, the, the cost of the machine we were using was on the order of $10 million. So having multiple machines was, <laughs> you know, it was a lot of overhead. Um, I don't know what the consequences would have been, but I, I instinctively feel that it would have completely transformed the process for us. Not always, not entirely for the better. We did a lot of good thinking in those three minute intervals. <laughs> Basically, it's sort of, we do an experimental run, you'd see the results. And then in the three minutes while we were waiting, we'd write up a little, you know, three lines about what we'd just just seen. Uh, sometimes, of course, we'd spend much more time if something very important had just happened. But most of the time, it was just a few minutes uh, of kind of writing. Um, but there was a, a lot of good thought got, 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 got done there. Uh, I've sometimes heard um, experimentalists sort of make comments to the effect of um, sort of, you know, more thinking and less work is, is sometimes the, 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 right, the right approach to to problems, but it's uh, it's not always the easiest thing to, to do. Actually, there's a, another uh, interesting example. I don't remember who I heard this from, possibly from Alan Kay, possibly from somebody who was at his school in Los Angeles. It's in the 70s or 80s. They've got a bunch of kids who are some of the first users of computers. And for certain problems, they actually had to, I think they would flip pieces of paper over the monitor to cut the kids off from the monitor so the kids couldn't just keep sort of randomly trying uh, calculations to solve some problem. Uh, instead, they actually had to stop and think. 
Um, so some, sometimes speed is is your enemy, but it's uh, it's it's not so obvious uh, when or how the transformations will be. Actually, that's a fun question. I think is to think about cases when really dramatically speeding something up, sort of the ability to iterate, has actually resulted in a sort of a secular slowdown. Like the the, the overall process has maybe been hurt hmm. by it. I don't know. Can you can you think of any examples like that? I would say debugging often has this effect in programming where if I get into a rhythm while I'm debugging and I'm just trying all sorts of different things, sometimes, I mean, this is, this is something many, many people experience where as soon as you step away from the computer to go to the restroom or grab a coffee or go to sleep and you wake up the next morning, that's when the solution sort of hits your brain. And I think the fact that you can, you have so many ways to test something at your fingertips um, mm. can often stop you from stepping away and just like letting the problem sink into your subconscious. Right. So g- going, f- going for a walk is often the best debugger. Is right. Right. And luckily saying. there are certain basic human needs that you have to fulfill that sort of force <laughs> that on you. <laughs> like, Oh, I haven't eaten in 12 hours. Maybe I should stop trying to find this bug that is making me so frustrated. And then you go have a sandwich and you think, Oh, I solved it. And I'm sure that I, I think on the other hand though, those hours of debugging and poking at the system and getting lots of different inputs into your mm. brain, they they are helping you build a model and that subconscious process would not be able to do what you want uh, if you hadn't done a lot of that. As good as uh, slowing things down can be sometimes, I think that there are plenty of processes in the world that slow things down already. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Uh, it's much harder to speed things up. So I'll I'll tend to bias towards tools that will make me faster. Um, Uh Because yeah, there's just plenty of things that are going to make you stop and, you know, give you time to think, but uh, not so many that help you get interesting, relevant inputs more quickly. I I wonder. Um, the, The use of libraries in computing seems closely related where like some particular libraries will become so canonical. I'm thinking of uh, the Linpack library in, in, in science, which is used to do linear algebra. Um, I wonder, you know, maybe there are people like debugging that all the time. Uh, but I also wonder if, if maybe actually um, important parts of the code may just end up being sort of civilizationally neglected. They like, they become like infrastructure that everybody uses, but nobody ever thinks about. Um, it's a really interesting kind of long-term trend, I think, in, in our civilization that more and more of these pieces of infrastructure, you know, some group or person spends an enormous amount of effort developing them. And if they're really good, then they just sort of sit there and nobody really has to think about them for, for a long time. And we're gradually building more and more layers of that. So it's really good from like an immediate speed perspective. You, you just want to be able to import NumPy or whatever but um, over the long term, it creates interesting failure point for catastrophic failure. If there's a bug in one of those things in some important way, uh, it can potentially have sort of interesting system-wide effects. This is the stuff of my nightmares. I'm not going <laughs> to sleep tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> no worries. Oh, I don't know. You think about things like um, I'm sorry, I I, I I flew over the um, I think it's the like it's the main kind of distribution center for uh, I guess you know supermarkets and whatnot in uh, in Toronto once, and uh, it was just interesting kind of looking down from the plane and thinking when you've got a centralized system like that that is so important for like an essential function of a city, what happens when that starts to fail? You know, just how brittle are, uh, are the systems. I wonder about it. So I, I gave the example of Linpack before. I'm sure that Linpack is used in things like uh, the discovery by the Large Hadron Collider of the Higgs boson or the discovery of gravitational waves by LIGO and probably in a zillion other uh, important uh, discoveries. And uh, it's just a sort of a fun game to play to think about um, you know, how would you detect subtle software bugs uh, in in the output from 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 those experiments i'm quite confident those teams you know they know a lot about what they're doing uh, but at least as a science fictional sort of scenario um it's fun to think about um uh the possibility of bugs very deep inside software actually really causing us to come to erroneous conclusions about the way the world works um, in in 
you know, maybe the way in which food gets distributed or electricity is, you know, the electrical grid is stabilized or something like that. And there's all those stories of um, biology labs using Excel and then like genes get parsed as dates by Excel instead of genes and then all these results are way off as a result. Like I, I, I hear stories like this pop up pretty frequently. Uh, and those are just the ones that we hear about. I'm sure that there are many, many more that we are not aware of. I think this is where <laughs> the importance of uh -huh. like of of viewing problems in different ways becomes so important through different lenses so that you can sanity check the results. I mean, I you know, in in math class, I remember in, in elementary school, I remember them saying like, try to solve the problem two different ways. And that way, if you made a mistake in one of the paths, it will show up and you'll, you'll see that there's a different result. I would imagine though, with some of these problems in physics, it's probably pretty difficult to show it in one way, let alone in two ways. So actually the, for the, the Higgs boson, there are at least two detectors at uh, the LHC. And so you can, you know, in principle sort of run, they're not entirely independent. Like there's certainly going to be a lot of common infrastructure still. Like, you know, they'll still all be using whatever, you know, Intel or AMD or something processors. So there's still the possibility, you know, it's not like they're completely uncorrelated, but um, there's a quite a bit of independence. For LIGO, they had a team whose job was to infect, it was to inject um, a fake signal. Um, essentially, um, you know, it was to, it was to, act as a, sort of a chaos monkey in the um, in the system, um, which I think is just great. Like, you know, having that kind of adversarial uh, group built into the um, built into the design of the experiment is so cool. It also, it must have been so much fun for those people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, imagine, you know, you do it, you know, you're part of a scientific group and you, you, you're hired actually to sneak into the lab at night and, uh, <laughs> and do nasty things is kind of essential is the role that they had. And you want to be resilient against, against that kind of behavior. It sounds like white hat penetration testing and software systems uh, yeah, very much. In intellectual systems. That's fun. I would I would definitely watch a, a heist movie with that premise. <laughs> That's such a great idea. That's <laughs> such a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> or at least like a sci-fi novel heist movie. I think I think that would be fun. Uh, actually, a great thing about science fiction is, you know, it seems like any idea you, you or I could possibly have some sci-fi author has has at least written a short story about it. They're so imaginative. We'll have to dig one up and, and link it in the show notes if, uh, if we can find it. But besides intellectual chaos monkeys, what are some of the most successful tools for thought that you've seen in physics? Um, language, mathematics, uh, symbols. You know, these are all things we take for granted, but of course they're just amazingly important. Uh, you know, things like Hindu Arabic numerals, super easy to take for granted. Even actually just the idea that place matters for numerals is incredibly deep. Um, you know, the fact that if I, don't know, I consider the number 21, the meaning two has a very different meaning in 21 than it does when it's just two alone. Um, it has a you know, utterly different meaning. We don't think about that, but it's actually quite a different symbol in some sense. The context has changed its meaning. So I think you're asking probably about much more recent things though. Is that right? <laughs> that That is true, but that was also a good answer. What are, what are some recent uh, tools for thought developed in physics say in the last 100 years? Um, <laughs> just narrow, na well, just narrowing down to a century, uh, yeah. not even not even giving me a hundred thousand years. Yeah, <laughs> certainly Mathematica has had an enormous impact on physics. So too of things like uh, MATLAB and and uh, NumPy and things like that. I have used those systems, but I'm not a master in the way some people are. I had a student, Henry Hazelgrove, who uh, it was just astonishing what Henry could do with MATLAB. Yeah, you know, we would have a conversation about what I thought of as a very conceptual, theoretical kind of a question. He would just spend a few minutes in MATLAB, and he, even though he was doing computations with particular matrices, he was able to get conceptual insight and to sort of make it about abstract mathematics, which I thought was it was very interesting. Uh, it was very rapid, and it was much more rapid than I could possibly do, sort of being restricted to um, well, just a completely different mode of, of thinking. So I thought that was... It was it was really it's really interesting to work with people who have that kind of capacity to generate to use 
take very com- concrete calculations with specific numbers, but to draw con- interesting conclusions about very abstract uh, conceptual questions. Physics has certainly changed to the point where computational and numerical methods you know, have really become a third way of understanding um, so many systems. You, know, you just can't analytically solve uh, a lot of problems. You, you know, if you want to understand what the gravitational wave signature of colliding uh, black holes is going to look like, um, you need to do some uh, pretty heavy-duty numerical calculation that will tell you then what sort of smoking gun signatures to, to look for. So in some sense, just that ability to do simulation has transformed, well, it's transformed not just physics, but it's transformed all of science. It's like you're able to take a system specification, which is very broad, and then answer questions about specific behaviours under specific circumstances, which absent simulation, you know, would just be completely and utterly inaccessible to you. Um, you, know, you can't solve the problem of, of figuring out what kind of gravitational wave signature will be provided by uh, two colliding black holes. You can't do that in theory. The problem is too complicated. You could do it experimentally if you knew that you had two black holes nearby but we don't know that we have two black holes nearby. We're trying to figure out if what we're seeing is in fact two black holes. And so, you know, it's important then to have this, this extra method, this method of simulation, which is able to say, oh, two black holes colliding would look like this in a gravitational wave signature. So then, you know, you study a whole bunch of sort of events like that. Maybe you didn't see in your simulations um, about uh, black holes and how they behave. Um, and that then uh, can be used as input to to other experiments. I don't know. That, that's a before you asked. I, I don't know that that particular example. How is it transforming science in that in that particular instance? It's enabling you to make inferences about systems where you're not actually you know in the experiment you're not actually sure what the constituent systems are, and you're instead inferring it from the outcome of some theory plus uh, a, a numerical simulation. So that's a, that's a new ability in, in science and a, a pretty pretty significant one. I, I think somehow, like, you can certainly do the thing where you just try simulating lots and lots of different possible systems that you think might be out there somehow, you know, neutron stars colliding, a neutron star uh, and a black hole colliding, other sorts of, you know, many other uh, possibilities. You can simulate all of them, and then you can look in the data to see, uh, you know, are there signatures in the data yeah, that's been that's been the process. I, I do know that yeah, they they did do uh, early simulations of of some of these important sort of plausible classes of astrophysical phenomena, and then they actually just had to wait and see what actually showed up in in the data. There was no guarantee that they were going to see black holes colliding. What are some areas of physics where you think that we could have that we would benefit from better tools for thought, where our thinking is kind of hazy because we don't have maps that help us really understand what's going on. It is certainly true, and, and I have played a lot with tools which are just meant to represent particular individual systems. As an example, I guess I'll use my friend Grant Sanderson's YouTube channel, 3 Blue, 1 Brown. You know, it's, not, it's not a tool, but at least a, hopefully makes the point clear. You know, he does these beautiful animated 3D graphics which show typically systems in from you know, illustrating phenomena in mathematics, sometimes from physics, sometimes from other areas, but most often from, from mathematics. And, and you know, you're just able to build intuition uh, often relatively easily by seeing these kind of animated uh, drawings that um, you wouldn't have in, in any other way. It's uh, extremely striking. I mean, it's a very simple example and super common, but... Um, in many ways, I feel like, you know, it, it's a pity in some sense that it's not more routine. This is quite a, quite a startup cost to doing it uh, to the extent that we can make it easier and easier to do those kinds of things. Um, uh, it's certainly a good, a good intuition generator. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to create the, the quality of graphics that Grant does for his videos. I do think that there are relatively lower bars that people still don't make it over. Um, just even drawing drawing a very simple 
line graph can often be so elucidating. And I can't, I can't even count uh, the number of times that in a company I spent an hour or two drawing a visual that sort of explained my thinking and thinking, hey, this, this won't help that much. Like, this is kind of a waste of time. I should have been doing real work. And then I share it with other people on my team and they go, oh, now I understand. This makes sense. And then sort of like, so sometimes an entire team will form around that diagram and solve a problem. Um, and it's always, it's always so valuable to do it. And I always then kick myself and think, why don't I spend more of my time doing this? Because mm-hmm. suddenly all of these people understand something that uh, they previously didn't. And my own understanding is better because once I drew it out, I realized, oh, this thing doesn't quite add up or it doesn't, yeah. it's it, it, this thing that was in my head actually doesn't map to paper very well, which either means I think it's a strong smell that there's something wrong, or it means that there's some way I'm representing it that doesn't quite capture what what matters. But uh, yeah, these things are always so valuable. I think it, it seems that most people underrate them, myself included. Why? Why is that? <laughs> Certainly, uh, myself included as well. Sort of. It's funny. <laughs> like I don't know. The question: Why did you know different representations of the same ideas help so much? It's pretty clear. That lots of people have that experience. I enjoy you know, Venkatesh Rao. The, you know, he loves to draw two by twos for absolutely sort of everything. Um, and uh, yeah, they're surprisingly often sort of yeah they 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 make you uh, think about things in 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 a slightly different way. Uh, yeah, so there's a cheap answer, and I think there's a better answer. The cheap answer is when you arrange something in a new representation, it does make it sometimes easier to see other connections, which you, you know, had formerly escaped you. you know, so you see, oh, this you know, might be related to, to this other thing in such and such a way. Maybe the, I think the, the better answer, um, like some years ago, I, I developed a little prototype that was for studying the motion of uh, physical systems uh, in one dimension. And the thing that I did in the prototype that I was pleased with was I found a way of representing the conservation of energy so that you could just see conservation of energy directly sort of in the visual representation provided by the prototype. And even though, you know, I've been doing physics for most of my life, 30 odd years, um, and I'd applied conservation of energy, I don't know how many thousands or tens of thousands of times before, I found just being able to see it directly in this visual representation of the system completely changed the way I related to it. It was no longer an algebraic manipulation that I was doing. Instead, I could just see what to expect. And, and that simple change um, really made a difference to, to, how, to how, how I thought about it. For one thing, I mean, it's just because, of course, you know, a visual processing system is so powerful. You know, it operates in, in parallel, whereas the you know, symbolic manipulation I was doing using to to think about uh, conservation of energy before that. It's very sort of serialized, um, so it's much harder to get a global view. But but the key thing to do there was to design into the interface in this prototype so that the prototype provided a direct representation of an important deep result about the system. In my particular case, it was the conservation of energy. And I found a few other examples, um, a little prototype to illustrate some ideas about um, uh, complex analysis. Um, and again, I, I found that, that just being able to see directly rather than having to do the symbolic manipulations um, certainly helped me. Uh, uh, it changed my experience. Whether it would have changed other people's experience, I don't know. It was just a, it was a little, little sort of uh, sketched out uh, prototype. Um, not, a, not a system that was ever shipped for wide distribution. One thing that I've noticed in our sort of general social group and beyond in the last five or so years is the the rise of the independent researcher. Uh, it seems mm-hmm. to me like more and more people are choosing settings outside of traditional academia to pursue lines of inquiry that previously would have found a home in universities. First, there's sort of two questions. One is just, does that match your observations? Because you've you've been much more embedded in science for a much longer time than I have. Um, And if it does match your observations, what is driving that shift? I mean, intuitively it does. I don't have any real data to support it. Just sort of noticing more and more people, which might just be that I'm getting older, I'm no more people. Um, (laughs) But I don't 
I don't think that's what's going on. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a sort of good, really good structure. I mean, there's at least two really good structural reasons for it, and maybe three. One really good structural reason is it's just getting a lot easier to access papers and other sort of serious materials. You can participate in in conversation. So in that sense, yeah, the academy has kind of opened up um, a little bit. And the second, which is very closely related is that those communities of practice are no longer as closed as they used to be. Actually, it's kind of shocking to me to realise, looking back on my experience of quantum computing in the late 1990s and early 2000s, was my experience at least, was quite insular. And I think it's much easier now to be sort of, to sit on the boundary. Um, I still, I track... Um, at least a little bit of stuff about quantum computing. Mostly, I mean, a lot of it is just catching up with old friends and sort of gossiping um, about about stuff. But it's made a lot easier by social media. Like, there is no doubt about that. It's just hugely, hugely easier to sit on a lot of those uh, different boundaries, um, not just with you know one field, but with two, three, ten, thirty fields. Um, and somebody who wants to be an independent researcher in some field, of course, can. You know, to some extent, just embed themselves. Actually, in AI, you know, it's been interesting to watch certain people who don't have PhDs or, in some cases, undergraduate degrees, you know, become significant parts of the AI community. I'm thinking about people like Chris Olar and Alec Radford and others who don't, you know, they haven't necessarily done the PhD and all that kind of thing, but they have nonetheless sort of become part of the, the or very important parts of the the community. And I think that's been uh, helped a little bit also by that, that sort of permeability. The third thing, and this is, uh, I think, just more speculative, I, you know, I can't, you know, the first two things, I can just point to loads of, you know, very specific examples where I've just witnessed it happening. The third thing, it's interesting to think about, you know, sources of capital to support this. You know, there's some, inter- some question about whether or not there's been a rise in sort of funding for that. So people supporting themselves on Substack or on Patreon or uh, maybe through sort of uh, patronage um, in some way, it's sort of no longer, I mean, to what, you know, to what extent would you call them uh, independent researchers under those arrangements? I don't know. But it's certainly not a traditional arrangement uh, and there does seem to be uh, a considerable rise. Yeah, maybe there were precedents in previous generations. We were talking before about Jane Jacobs. She certainly didn't have, you know, she wasn't an urban uh, planner in sort of the the traditional mould. She was able to arrange a certain amount of sort of independent funding, but I think in some ways she'd have to be regarded as a um, an independent researcher, one who became one of, if not the most influential person in her field ever. So, you know, maybe unbeknownst to me, there were lots of people like that back then and I'm simply picking on the, the person who, who was, you know, a particularly outstanding example. Um, so I, I don't know whether the sources of capital have increased or, or what's happened. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. Actually, be a, it's, not, it's not a bad research question. Someone, someone listening to this hopefully can, uh, they perk up their ears. Hopefully they also write that, that sci-fi heist novel i'm hoping that we can plant a few seeds of ideas actually i like the idea that uh it was occurred to me before marie kondo should write a sequel the life-changing magic of finding new representations Um, (laughs) (laughs) she might not be the right person to write it but yeah jane Jane jacobs is an interesting example because i think the fact that she is independent or what was independent was so important to the results that she ended up sort of discovering and, and see and the the dynamics that she noticed a lot of it came from her being a mother who just spent a lot of time walking around cities and just noticing things and all of those observations over years piling up to make give give her opinions and views and perspective that other people didn't have whereas had she been sitting in a traditional urban planning department uh in an office or had she been in an academic setting studying sort of land use economics mm. or something, she would, she would have a very different viewpoint mm. and it mm. would be much more colored by what people say is true than what she actually sees on the ground. And I think that, that those modes of thinking can definitely solve a lot of important problems, but the, that inductive approach of just what do I see? What, do, what do I think is happening? Yeah. 
You've changed my opinion just now about something, actually, with that. Um, so David Keith, who's a very well-known proponent of, of uh, geoengineering, um, he's written books about to increase the reflectivity of the Earth's atmosphere as a way of ameliorating some but not all of the effects of global warming. And uh, in his book, he makes a comment very similar to what you just said. He said, you know, he worries that too many of the people making decisions about climate um, and related things are doing so in air-conditioned conference rooms. Um, and he sort of makes a plea basically for people just to go out and sort of into the environment um, and spend some time uh, sort of seeing the world and, and whatnot. And I, I must admit, I when I read that, I sort of dismissed it as misplaced romanticism. And uh, I think your example just now of Jane Jacobs has made me change my mind. <laughs> He's kind of making, I guess, a plea for just diversity of experience. And uh, yeah, insofar as it's hard to say what experiences are relevant, uh, maybe, maybe maybe it's a good point. You're certainly right about Jacobs. So. Yeah, with climate, it feels more wrong to me, but I need, I, I, I want to think about why. And my immediate thought is, oh, that's so wrong because when you go out, there's only so much of the climate that you can experience. The planet is huge. All, you know, if you're in California and you experience wildfires, you might think, yes, climate change is a big issue, but actually maybe maybe the fires are caused by mismanagement over decades and it's kind of uncorrelated or, or unrelated to climate change. Perhaps, I'm not making that claim. No. Um, that's my immediate reaction. But then I think, you know, when you go out, you still might see things that are just totally contradictory to what your model is. and might completely shock you. Like um, I've spent a lot of time in Argentina over the last few years, and I had read a lot about monetary policy and inflation before that in sort of theoretical terms, but there's something really different about seeing it on the ground where you realize, I, I, I had the realization that I really didn't understand the phenomenon at all until I was yeah. there. Yeah. There's just so many other social effects, um, sort of outlook on life that I just hadn't really registered because I hadn't been there. And yeah, I'm not, I haven't spoken with every Argentinian. I think there's like 40 million of them. So I'm missing a lot of that experience, but the handful that I have gotten to know really well have sort of made me realize that I was missing a big part of the picture. So I could totally see something like that happen with the climate where, yeah, you're not going to see every square inch of earth at every moment in time, but you probably don't need that to correct some of the biggest errors in your thinking. Yeah. I mean, I think in the case of somebody like Jane Jacobs, I would have a priori not have been terribly sympathetic to the you know argument that it would help that much to spend that much time just engaged in, it's not even field work, it's just randomly walking around at some level. <laughs> and yet I think it's pretty clear that it that it did. It's sort of that unanticipated level of insight. And certainly people like, I don't know, you think about great explorers, I don't know, Jacques Cousteau and Robert Ballard and people like that, um, they uh, must have, uh, you know, they would just get a tremendous amount of insight. Actually, I, I shared an office uh, briefly with a person, uh, Thomas Lovejoy, who's um, the person who was the father of conservation biology, I think is the, the term that he coined. Um, and he just spent I think at that point he'd spent 40 or 50 odd years in the Amazon and he'd been tremendously involved in, I don't know, hundreds, possibly thousands of different cases of sort of trying to save different parts of the Amazon rainforest. And it was interesting just to talk to him about, you know, he had so much varied on the ground experience of just all the different sort of local conditions. There was certainly a, a lot of very contingent knowledge. He, he made the comment you know, that he'd really changed his sort of thinking over the years from, I guess, that, that much more sort of global view to uh, to a much more local sort of negotiated. Yeah. I've gone a little off track here, just uh, just 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 thinking about, uh, I guess it's a, in general, it's an obsession for me, the uh, thinking about this kind of local knowledge versus the, the sort of the abstract global view. I think very early in my career, I was very fond of sort of broad abstract arguments um, and I've become much more interested in and just enjoy having a multitude of very specific kind of instances in mind and trying to reason from collisions and inconsistencies between those. I was very enamored with theory when I was younger as well. And I think every year I get older, the more I appreciate specificity and uh, the messiness. And I realize like that's where all the interesting stuff is. Yeah. 
Yeah. And anyone can memorize a theory and try to apply it willy nilly. I think that's not that hard. It's actually integrating it and or, or, or finding evidence and integrating it into something broader that explains all that evidence. That's that's much harder and much more interesting. I think. Yep, certainly seems so to me. <laughs> uh. So my last question is um, based off of uh, someone that you quoted in one of your essays. Um, you said that the, the physicist John Wheeler once stated a useful principle to guide research. In any field, you should find the strangest thing and then explore it. So my question is, what's something strange that's captured your interest recently? I recently read um, Kasuo Ishiguro's um, The Buried Giant. I guess he's very well known for writing uh, The Remains of the Day and Never Let Me Go, which are books I love, um, particularly read The Remains of the Day. The Buried Giant, I enjoyed. It's basically a fairy tale set in Arthurian times and it doesn't entirely work. The strange thing, though, and the bit that kept me reading was it had the quality of being a fairy tale. And I don't know, like, there are many things that seem like fairy tales, but that are really, they're just stories about, about people. And they don't, they don't have a fae feeling to them. I read Neil Gaiman's book, Stardust, years ago, and it feels like a fairy tale. It feels like it was written a thousand years ago. And I don't know, I don't know why. That's the strange thing. I, I, what I want to understand is um, what is that sense of being fae, being out of time, there is some sense of strangeness in Stardust and the Buried Giant that I also find in Beowulf, that I find in The Lord of the Rings, that I find in Lord Dunsany, but that I don't find in almost all fantasy. Somehow it seems internally consistent, but very different. And I don't understand why. There's a, a, an essay I love by Tolkien, which is about process really the process of sort of creativity. He's talking about what he calls sub-creation, meaning the creation of a complete internally consistent world that is nonetheless different than ours. And that's what he was trying to do and where he was getting the force of myth from in The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion and some of his other works. There isn't the same sense of sub-creation in The Buried Giant or Stardust but there is still some strange sense. It's a sense of depth. In the case of the Buried Giant, it's embedded within the Arthurian legends, and maybe you get some something from that. You know, Arthur is so sort of throughout our culture. You know, it's in it's in everything in some ways. It's not as much as say the the Bible is in everything, but it it really strongly influences our our culture. Ideas about chivalry, ideas. Uh, about the way the genders treat each other, um, a lot of things like that are, are influenced by Arthur, Arthur in, in, in different ways. And so maybe the very giant borrows some of that and maybe that's where it gets its that sense from. I, I'm maybe appropriately, uh, I can't give a coherent answer because it's strange. Uh, I'm trying to understand what it is those authors are doing. How are they sourcing it? I don't actually, I don't particularly, a lot of people love Gaiman and I don't particularly. I find it his lighter work or his supposedly lighter work is the stuff that actually grabs me at all. Um, I like Stardust. I like Coraline. I love his book with Terry Pratchett, uh, Good Omens. Uh, neither of those authors on their own I particularly like, but uh, Coraline and, and Stardust somehow are the ones that actually seem deep to me, even while they're apparently little children's stories. Do you know what I mean by this sense of strangeness? There's there's two other types of experiences that I think might be similar. Um, tell me if they resonate. One is the experience of traveling to another place. And then also another is the experience of um, spending time with people who are religious when you are yourself not religious. Yeah, yeah that's great. Like, yeah, like I, I recently went to a, um, a fr family friend's family seder and um, their, their family is not Orthodox Jewish, but they have a lot of friends who are, who are more traditional and um, they had all of these rituals and 
things at the dinner that I could just tell had so much meaning to them and to their ancestors and to so many different people. And to me, I kind of understood a few surface level things and they explained a few things to me. Um, but it was a sense of like, I, it's, I both clearly don't subscribe to it myself, but also I can tell that this actually really does matter. Um, and I'm kind of befuddled, but also like th there's like, I'm also sort of awed by it um, mm. at the same time. So that's, that's what you're describing. There's, a, there's this whole world that they've created and this, a, a narrative about what they're doing with each other um, that I can't quite tap into, but I can tell that it's happening. There's something I think a little bit about um, just layers and layers of meaning. You see this in cities as well. Like some cities are very de designed. There's one reason why something is there. And some cities, you know, there's just so many layers by which they've been laid down. There's 27 different reasons why that thing is there. And there's even sort of, you know, there's differences. You can tell the thing that has been placed there by some bureaucrat and then there's something else that is there, maybe I mean, just the origin of the streets, which was determined by some accident that happened 2,000 years ago. And somehow there's something similar in, in social rituals like that and just stories that is like that. And maybe that's what somebody, a very clever writer like Gaiman is doing is he's sort of studied enough and internalised enough that he's reproducing some of those strange choices and you, you can sort of feel the layers of the past in it, uh, something like that. That would be one sort of possible theory or possible explanation of what's uh, what's going on or giving it these interesting and strange resonances. That Barbara Tversky has this, um, she makes this nice point about language. If you sort of think about it in user interface terms, the great thing about language is, you know, you might, if you have, the language has a lot of speakers, Hundreds of millions of people are contributing constantly to user testing and they're turning over all the features. They get to design the features um, <laughs> and they get to do it over like centuries or, you know, longer. Um, and so in that sense, you know, it's got a lot more contributors. And I guess myth uh, and fairy tale has the same kind of quality. Um, they're often retold over and over and over and over again. And so they end up, you know, one theory would be to say, oh, they end up very watered down because of that. Um, you know, a lot of the rough edges are hewn off. But I also wonder a little bit at uh, the extent to which maybe some very deep elements get preserved, uh, which we don't entirely understand why they're there, but they are there for very good reasons. Um, Richard Feynman, the physicist, said that he got very, actually, he got very interested in story and in particular, he got very interested in fairy tales and he tried to write some. And he said that he discovered that his fairy tales were just completely boring um, and he couldn't <laughs> understand. They were always just boring, you know, recapitulations of elements he'd already seen. He would feel that nothing else was possible. And then he would talk to a friend in the English department and they would you know, say, oh, no, 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 you know, here's another example. And it would have the same kind of force again and the same kind of originality. Maybe that's actually what I'm responding to in, in the examples, the two, the two examples I gave. There is some kind of mythic force whose origin I don't understand and I, I would love to. Yeah, I mean, Tolkien famously wrote, it was books before he ever wrote the, the real books, right? And he, he wrote songs, he created a language, he, he created this very rich tapestry of a whole universe that, that existed um, and then built the story from there. So that I think really contributes to to what you're saying. It You, you had said something about... Um, the, the other author that uh, your, your model was maybe, maybe he had seen so much, he had been so attuned to real cultures that had complexity and nuance in them that he was able to then sort of generate it. It's interesting you say, because my, my intuition is that it would be very different, which is more, you have to create those layers over time. And it just takes an incredible amount of time to build it up and let it mutate and so on, which sounds more like what Tolkien maybe did where he, he created this mythology over time that, that layered on itself. Um, where, where does your intuition for the other approach come from? I guess, it, I mean, it's just reading sort of interviews with Gaiman and, and some of his nonfiction writing where you know, he's clearly incredibly observant about stuff. Um, uh, the, the book of his uh, that I, I probably most love is The Remains of the Day. In that book, I mean, it's just the story of, essentially a failed love affair between a butler running an English house. And it's just so carefully observed. That's what makes it beautiful. He has this enormous eye for detail and you don't 
appreciate all of the details. I'm sure I've reread that book several times and I've watched the movie many times and uh, I don't see everything. I see new things each time. I don't even know that it's necessarily an accurate representation of the milieu it's purportedly about. But his eye, eye for detail in human beings um, just seems um, astonishing to me. It always reminds me a bit of um, Jane Austen uh, also has that, that kind of just incredible eye for people. Well, that is uh, all the questions I'm going to ask. Thanks, Michael. Uh, this was a really fun conversation. I really enjoyed the excuse to dive deeper into your work. Thank you so much, Devin. It was absolutely lovely. <laughs>